Uh, so welcome to the latest uh, IRIS facilitated webinar. Uh, this one's going to be on the topic related to uh, research results from the Earthscope US Array facility. This is Andy Frasetto uh, speaking to you live from the headquarters office of the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology in Washington, DC. Uh, if you're not familiar with IRIS, we're about a 30-year-old consortium of universities and a science facility that's funded by NSF to operate programs that enable the earth science community to perform a broad spectrum of geophysical research, most of which is in seismology. Uh, if you don't know me personally, I'm the project associate, uh, aka Swiss Army Knife, who puts a lot of emails in people's inboxes, but also helps to manage Earthscope's US Array facility. Uh, the Global Seismic Network, and some of our other instrumentation and community engagement programs that we run out of IRIS. So these webinars are motivated to highlight some of the scientific results that are either directly re enabled by IRIS or represent important work from our partner organizations. And uh, I have a web page up right now, and this is the uh, webinar web page that can be accessed through uh, IRIS's homepage. And uh, what this is sort of a one-stop shop for all of our previous webinars. So if you scroll through here, you can see thumbnails along with title uh, information related to when these were uh, initially recorded and broadcast. So if there's a topic they're interested in or uh, you liked uh, today's webinar and you want to distribute it to a friend, these are archived on our YouTube channel. The entries on this page are updated within a few days and those are available for subsequent viewing. And then finally, uh, this is the last webinar of the fall. There will be more in the spring, but uh, it always helps when I'm putting together the uh, docket of talks to, to uh, solicit if there are any nominations out there. So if you're interested in a topic that has not been covered on this uh, list of webinar, either a technique that you're interested in or research area that, that you know of interesting work being done that hasn't been highlighted, Definitely send me a note uh, over email would be best, and I will try to uh, add those to the slate for the spring. Um, so I, I, without further ado, I want to just quickly introduce our speaker today. Uh, it's Dr. Cliff Froelich, who is the Associate Director and Senior Research Scientist at uh, University of Texas Austin's Institute for Geophysics. Uh, Cliff received his master's and PhD from Cornell. And he has a wide variety of interests, including deep earthquakes, moonquakes, analysis of earthquake catalogs, and earthquakes that occur uh, in particular in Texas, which of course is the topic that he's presenting today. So I think with, without uh, any further delay, I would like to introduce Cliff, uh, who will be presenting on induced and triggered earthquakes, examples from Texas. Well, salutations, salutations to my webinar audience. Um, I am Cliff Froelich, as Andy said, from the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm going to talk about induced or triggered earthquakes, examples from Texas. Now, um, as an earthquake seismologist in Texas, my family and many of my friends wonder what I do for a living. Uh, they've never heard of any earthquakes in Texas, and the only time uh, they ever see me outside of my grubby clothes is when there's a big earthquake in someplace else, like Japan or California, and I put on a coat and tie and uh, go on local television. So they imagine that my job is just sitting around with my, uh, uh, in my office with my good clothes in a glass case waiting for the next big earthquake. Um, now, um, Sharing with me the idyllic life of a Texas seismologist, I've had some great collaborators who've contributed hugely to the research I'm going to talk about today. Um, I want to especially acknowledge uh, uh, Brian Stump and Chris Hayward at SMU who were willing to share the data they collected on the Dallas-Fort Worth earthquakes in 2008-2009. And, and in the distant past, uh, I acknowledge Wayne Pennington and Scott Davis. Uh, Wayne Pennington uh, was a here at Texas, and he actually started a program on induced earthquakes in Texas more than 25 years ago. Um, there wasn't much interest then, and when he left Texas for greater things, I inherited his graduate student, uh, Scott Davis. And so uh, I've often said that uh, uh, most of the research I've been doing in the last few years was Wayne Pennington's idea, and Scott Davis was the brains of the operation. Um, in today's webinar, I'm first going to start with some background on uh, man-made induced triggered earthquakes. 
Um, then I'm going to talk about five areas in Texas where there, there are earthquakes that are probably induced or triggered. These are uh, the Barnett Shale in northeast Texas, including Dallas-Fort Worth, the Eagleford Shale in south central Texas, um, Snyder, which is a part of a town in west Texas, just south of the Panhandle, and Alice, that's not Dallas, it's Alice in south Texas, and finally at Timpson in east Texas. Um, I will uh, remind ourselves that some Texas earthquakes are natural, um, and the conclusion from my seminar is going to be that the examples I've talked about includes earthquakes that are uh, probably caused by injection of fluid wastes, some are caused by water flooding to enhance petroleum production, um, some by the extraction of petroleum and water, and some by CO2 injection. So there isn't any simple conclusion about what causes these earthquakes. Um, there's no silver bullet that says all uh, induced earthquakes are like this. Um, and finally, um, there are no earthquakes in Texas, or at least large enough for people to feel, that are caused directly by hydrofracturing. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about whether fracking is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, now, earthquake seismologists actually realized that human uh, activity could cause earthquakes in the 1930s when they were building Hoover Dam to fill uh, Lake Mead. And the uh, lake filling began about 1935. Um, they first felt earthquakes in 1936. They had a magnitude 5 in 1939, and there were thousands of earthquakes recorded. And uh, it was pretty clear that it was the lake that was doing it because the seismicity rate fluctuated with the water level. Um, the next milestone in human-caused earthquakes uh, occurred in the 1960s in Denver at the Den Denver Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Um, the Army was injecting uh, toxic waste into a deep well near Denver at a depth of about 3.6 kilometers. The, uh, I don't think the Army ever said what they were injecting, but most people thought it had something to do with the production of nerve gas. Uh, injection began in March of 1962. Uh, the first earthquakes uh, were felt in April of 1962. Um, and the geologist David Evans noticed that the seismicity rate was related to the injection rate. They stopped injecting in 1966, but the earthquakes continued. In fact, the largest earthquakes, a magnitude 5.3 uh, and a 5.2, occurred in 1967 after they had stopped injection. Um, so um, nowadays, seismologists generally acknowledge that humans can cause earthquakes in several different ways. Um, one is injecting waste fluids into deep wells, like in Denver. Another is other kinds of fluid injection, like water flooding to uh, enhance oil production. Uh, possibly carbon sequestration, uh, geothermal. Um, sometimes extraction of fluids c appears to cause earthquakes like oil and natural gas production. Um, lake and reservoir impoundment like the uh, Hoover Dam and Lake Mead thing. And sometimes mining, uh, there's collapses and rock bursts associated with mining. Um, seismologists sometimes make the distinction between earthquakes that are induced, that is human activity is actually changing the stress that causes the earthquake. For example, if you uh, uh, impound a reservoir, just the weight of the water could change the stress underground, and that might trigger or cause an earthquake. A triggered earthquake is when the uh, human activity doesn't change the stress, but it reduces friction on stuck faults, releasing natural tectonic stress. Uh, now, for triggered earthquakes, I sometimes think of what I call the air hockey table model. Um, the air hockey explanation for triggered earthquakes. If you imagine an air hockey table with the air off, and if you tilt it and put a puck on it, the uh, friction will keep the puck from sliding. Um, on the other hand, when you turn on the air, uh, the puck will slide because the friction is reduced. The stresses haven't changed. You still have the force of gravity that makes the puck want to slide, but turning on the air injects a fluid air reducing friction uh, allowing the uh, triggering the, uh, the puck sliding. And um, studies of crustal stress show that there are fault surfaces uh, nearly everywhere that are often tend to be near failure, but friction pretends slipping as rock on rock is pretty sticky and doesn't slip. But if you inject fluids into the subsurface, this pushes the sides of the fault apart, reducing friction, allowing slip, just like on your air hockey table. Um, now, there's been concern recently about induced and triggered earthquakes related to the recent development of unconventional gas shales. 
Um, uh, I'm going to talk later about the Barnett Shale, labeled BN here in Texas, and the Eagleford Shale, labeled EF. But there's a number of these, the Haynesville in Texas, Louisiana, the Permian Basin, there's the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, and there's the Marcellus Shale in New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And all of these, uh, there's concern that uh, there may be triggered earthquakes associated with developing these shales. Um, well, how does this work? Um, for example, in the Barnett Shale, uh, this is a uh, cartoon cross-section, um, there is gas, natural gas, in the Barnett strata. Um, however, the uh, uh, Barnett is very tight, that is, it is not permeable, so if you drill a well into the Barnett, you won't get much gas out just because the gas can't flow out. So um, the Barnett actually is also under the town of Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, however, if you frack the shale, you uh, uh, drill a well down and pump in high pressure, pressure fluids to fracture the, the shale, this makes uh, the gas flow more uh, uh, freely and you can produce the gas. Um, and this development has been uh, improved by uh, technological improvements in the last 20 years in horizontal dr drilling. So one well can have many different frac jobs and uh, you can produce areas like the Barnett. Now, when you produce the gas, some of the frac fluid comes back to the surface and this is dirty, salty water that you need to dispose of. So usually the or one popular method for disposing of this water is to inject it into other areas where water can flow freely. In the Barnett, they tend to inject it into the Ellenberger, which is a dolomite uh, limestone uh, strata beneath the Barnett. Unlike the Barnett, which is tight and uh, needs fracking, the Ellenberger is karsted and uh, fluids flow, flow very uh, freely. And so it's a perfect place for uh, injecting uh, waste fluids. Um, so, um, when does developing these shales cause earthquakes? Um, well, the development of a uh, shale gas well requires four distinct steps. Um, first, you have to drill a well, um, then you have to hydrofracture the well uh, by pumping in high pressure fluids. Then you produce the well where you're extracting gas and some of these fluids that come back. And then you have to inject these uh, fluids into a waste disposal well. So the process is four steps, drilling, fracking, extraction, and injection. Now, as far as I know, drilling well never causes earthquakes. Um, fracking wells almost never causes earthquakes large enough to feel. I'm unaware of any earthquakes in Texas related directly to fracking that were uh, large enough for people to feel. There's been a few examples worldwide, but the uh, earthquakes are small, smaller than four, and uh, it's not uh, really a serious problem because it's very rare. Sometimes producing a well and extracting gas and fluids causes earthquakes. However, it hasn't happened in the situations with the unconventional gas resources. Um, generally, when extraction has caused earthquakes, you have fields where huge amounts of oil or gas has been produced over decades. Um, and this isn't the kind of situation when you're fracking individual uh, wells. But finally, sometimes injection uh, for fr uh, fluid waste disposal does cause earthquakes. So again, I want to emphasize that hydrofracturing almost never causes true earthquakes, that is, events with magnitude above one and a half or so. Um, sometimes when I explain this to people in the press, they'll listen carefully, and the next day I'll get a headline that says, scientists at Texas says that fracking causes quakes or drilling causes quakes. And the reason they say this is that sometimes drilling and fracking are used as generic terms for the whole process. However, that's really uh, a dangerous statement because if drilling or fracking caused earthquakes that might be hazardous, it would be a problem. If it's the fluid that, uh, the waste fluids that are the problem, you have alternatives for disposing them. You can uh, truck them or pipe them to a different area. You can take them to a well which, where earthquakes aren't caused or you could even treat them like sewage, uh, and uh, so the, uh, you have alternatives. And in fact, given the, uh, how water is likely to be in Texas, uh, I suspect in 30 years, when we tell people that we were injecting water into the ground to get rid of it, they'll say, what? You mean you just pumped it back in the ground? Because it's uh, becoming in increasingly valuable. Now, when a frac job is in process, uh, it looks something like this. 
um, all these uh, rectangular containers are containers of frack water, um, which are pumped into the well. Um, the pond or tank over there is where you store the frack fluids that come back before you dispose of them. Um, now, if you're um, if this is in your neighborhood, if this frack pad is in, in your neighborhood, suppose you live in this house in the lower right-hand corner. Um, if you have the mineral rights, um, this would be a wonderful thing. That is, the trucks rumbling past would just be money uh, jingling in the bank. On the other hand, if you're in the house on the lower right and you don't have the mineral rights, um, these frack pads are sometimes considered uh, kind of a, uh, a nuisance. Um, now, there are parts of the country, there are uh, huge numbers of these frack pads, um, you might drive along a highway in these parts of the country and not see them, but from the air, it's a very different story. Um, here's a, uh, a picture taken from an airplane flying near the uh, Texas Motor Speedway. And what you see is all these uh, spots of cleared off areas um, near the, uh, on the landscape. And probably each one of these is a frack pad. Um, and so there are areas where there are just enormous numbers of these things. Now, Texas has some earthquakes, and it has lots of wells for producing oil and gas and for disposing of uh, inject, uh, waste fluids. And so are some of these quakes caused by extraction or injection? Um, in the map here, we have a map of Texas, and the circles are earthquakes. Um, the green circles are quakes that are almost certainly natural because there's no oil or gas fields nearby, and there's no injection wells. The red circles are quakes that are near oil and gas fields or injection wells. The yellow squares are injection wells in Texas. Um, and in Texas, there's more than 10,000 active injection wells. Some of them have been uh, injecting for decades. And so are some of these quakes caused by extraction or injection? The answer is yes, some of them are, as we'll see. Um, and is there a simple relationship? And uh, one of my points today is uh, there's a relationship, but it's not simple. Now, um, I've been doing research over the last few years trying to see what is the relationship between earthquakes and injection wells in Texas. Um, it's, uh, until quite recently, um, it was problematic because as recently as 2005, there were only about half a dozen uh, broadband continuous earthquake stations operating in Texas. Here's a map of Texas with the uh, triangles being broadband earthquake stations. And you can see that uh, there's huge areas of Texas where an earthquake can occur. Um, with these stations, you can probably identify an earthquake if it's bigger than magnitude three and a half or maybe three. But the location uncertainty of this event might be 10 kilometers or even more. So it would be too large to attribute to a particular well or uh, field operation. Now, this changed in 2009 to 2011 with the passage of the EarthScope US Array program through Texas. Um, uh, most of you are familiar with this, but um, starting around 2004, there were about 400 seismic stations that were installed in the western US between Canada and Mexico. And then each year since then, uh, the half of the stations have leapfrogged eastward. And so uh, the whole country has been covered by high quality seismic stations uh, with uh, separations of about 70 kilometers. Um, between 2009 and 2011, these stations were in Texas. Um, and so instead of having half a dozen stations to uh, identify and locate earthquakes, we had more like 100. And this presented uh, me with an opportunity to survey much smaller quakes than usual in Texas and to locate them much more accurately. Uh, now, in this presentation, I'm going to consider uh, earthquakes in five different areas that I have studied. Um, the first, I'm going to look up in northeast Texas, where the green circle is, uh, near Dallas-Fort Worth and the Barnett Shale. Um, this is a map of parts of northeastern Texas. In the uh, upper left-hand corner, the rectangle shows the low, uh, area of the rest of the map. The gray in this map is the Barnett Shale. The triangles, the white triangles, are the seismic stations from the USA program. Here, the circles are all seismic events. The gray circles are events that the US Geological Survey reported between 2009 and 2011. The green circles are events that I identified using the US array stations as Pori blasts. Um, and the red 
uh, circles are events that I identified as probable earthquakes. Um, and the green lines are map faults. Now, my survey identified about eight times as many quakes as reported by the U.S. Geological Survey. This isn't because the USGS was doing a bad job. It's just that I had a much more dense seismic network with the U.S. array stations. And also, I was willing to invest a lot more time locating sort of rotten, small earthquakes than uh, the USGS can do when they're routinely locating earthquakes across the whole country. Now, what's interesting about the results here is that all the earthquakes I found were in this six-county area uh, in the rectangle up here. And this will be in the next slide. This is the six-county area. The red circles are the earthquakes I identified uh, using the U.S. Array data. Uh, the large circles are ones that uh, were better quality events and I could locate more accurately. Here, the yellow squares are injection disposal wells that had injection rates of at least 150,000 barrels of water per month for one or more months in recent years. And what's interesting about this map is that uh, all the well-located quakes are in clusters that are within 3.2 kilometers or two miles of these high volume disposal wells. So for example, the uh, cluster related DFW was the cluster at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. The cluster at the bottom labeled J-C is near Cleburne, Texas. And you can see in Johnson County, there are other clusters labeled JB and JD and so on. There's also an earthquake in Hood County, an earthquake in uh, Wise County, and so on. So all the quakes that I identified were near high volume disposal wells. But what's also interesting about this is there's many wells that have no nearby quakes. In Johnson County, um, there's wells that have quakes, but there's plenty of wells that don't have quakes. And when you go over to Parker County in the west side of this map, there's plenty of high volume injection wells and we found no earthquakes. Um, now if we go back to the whole Barnett Shale again, here we have the red circles are the earthquakes that I located. The yellow squares are the high volume injection wells. What we see, and, and, and we ask ourselves, well why are we getting quakes where we do? Well, um, it's clear that there are quakes near wells, for example in Johnson County, but there's plenty of wells and counties with no quakes. For example, if you go uh, three counties over from Tarrant County is, uh, well, uh, is uh, the next county over from Tarrant County is Parker County uh, with no quakes. And you go two more counties over is Stevens County where they have plenty of wells and no quakes. In the southern part of the Barnett Shale in Comanche and Bosque and Hamilton County, uh, there's no wells and no quakes. But the question is why do uh, quakes occur near some wells and uh, not in others. And so uh, this result motivated me to say that we needed to do more of these surveys in other uh, producing shale areas like the Eagleford in the Bakken and so on. Um, so why are there quakes, uh, you know, can we speculate about why there are quakes in some areas and not others? Um, the map here is a map of uh, near the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, the left-hand county, Tarrant County, is Fort Worth. The right-hand county, Dallas, is Dallas County. The triangles are stations that were run by uh, the SM, my SMU colleagues after the Dallas-Fort Worth earthquakes in 2008 and 2009. And here, the little yellow square is where we located all the events that were apparently, uh, that occurred in this area in, after 2008. And, What's noticed is that this area is right near this mapped fault on the Texas tectonic map. And so possibly one reason that some wells are having earthquakes and others are not is that the wells with earthquakes are near faults that are stuck. And uh, as I mentioned with the air ho hockey model, if you pump fluids into these faults, you can unstick them. And so possibly earthquakes are occurring near favorably oriented faults that uh, are stressed uh, in the uh, pumping the fluids relieves the regional stress, but this is a speculation. We don't know that for sure. Um, so coming out of this survey of the Barnett Shale, there were a number of questions. Um, one is, if we look elsewhere, will the uh, earthquakes only occur near injection wells or not? And um, are there 
faults near wells that trigger earthquakes in our faults absence near wells with no earthquakes. Um, how long after injection begins do the quakes start? And do only the higher volume wells trigger earthquakes? And I must say, at this stage in my research, I was looking for what I would call a silver bullet. And uh, in my misspent youth, I used to read a lot of comic books, uh, including The Lone Ranger. As you know, The Lone Ranger shot silver bullets, but silver bullet is used as a, uh, here as a, is there a simple result about injection-induced earthquakes that would make it uh, straightforward to manage injection and avoid hazard? As can we find any uh, simple thing like just don't inject more than $150,000 a month, 150,000 barrels a month, and you're safe. As far as silver bullets goes, um, I'm told by my uh, children that silver bullets are good against werewolves, but I can't comment because my research hasn't gone yet in that direction. Now, um, the uh, next location I want to talk about is the Eagleford Shale, down in the area where this green circle is. The green circle was a magnitude 4.8 earthquake that occurred in October of 2011. Now before I start, um, sometimes when I tell people that I'm studying earthquakes in Texas, they say, well, how do you go about investigating earthquakes in some region of Texas? And I always tell them that the first thing that you do is you do reconnaissance work to look for signs of earthquake activity. For example, if you're driving south from Austin towards the Eagleford, um, you run across this billboard on uh, Highway 35 that says, you know, see an earthquake from the inside out. And this is an advertisement for a cave there where there's a fault in the cave that shows an offset, and they're advertising it as an earthquake from the inside out. And clearly, this is a sign of earthquake activity. Um, the second thing you can do in your recon reconnaissance survey is you go to a bar, and the uh, oil, the petroleum business is a boom or bust sort of thing. So if they're in the boom cycle, the bar is going to be just filled with uh, oil company geologists who are having a drink. And so you buy them a beer, and uh, they'd be glad to talk to you about uh, faults and uh, earthquakes and tectonic uh, action. Um, if you're in a bus cycle for the uh, uh, oil uh, situation, um, the bartender is probably a geologist who's uh, making a living until the boom happens again. And so if you go up to the bartender and say, you, you, you got any of those fault beers? Um, in most areas I've been in, like California and Texas, there are beers named after fault. This is the Balcones Fault uh, Ale. Anyway, the bartender would be happy to talk to you about the uh, tectonics of Texas. Um, now, on a more serious note, um, in the Eagleford, here we have the, the rectangle in, the, uh, uh, in Texas shows the area of this map. The gray uh, uh, shaded area is the area of the Eagleford. Here the yellow uh, squares are injection disposal wells, and the circles are historical earthquakes that have uh, been recorded or, you know, reported in this part of Texas over the last 150 years or so. And these include the red 2011 magnitude 4.8 earthquake, which is the largest earthquake this, this area has experienced. Um, now, when I studied this area on the map, in this map, on the, uh, the green circles are seismic events that I uh, was able to identify using the Earthscope stations. Um, on the right, the circles are the same circles as on the left, except the green circles are events that occurred from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening on Monday to Friday whereas the red circles are events that occurred on weekends and during non-work hours. And so you see these areas, like in the uh, uh, center of the map, where all the earthquakes are green. And so uh, uh, these are almost certainly quarry blasts. Um, one reason we know that is because they seem to only occur during regular working hours. The second reason is if you go to uh, Google map there, you'll find huge uh, rock quarries. Um, and finally, they look like shallow earthquakes with big surface waves. However, we can see that there are also events that don't occur during regular work hours. The red events are almost certainly earthquakes. Um, the right-hand box is the area near Fashing, Texas, which I'll uh, show in the next slide. Um, here on the left hand, we have this mapped area. Uh, the injection wells are the yellow 
squares. Um, the ellipses here show the uh, felt area for the October 2011 earthquake. The uh, area marked uh, Roman numeral 6 is the highest intensity area where they experienced mortality intensity 6. Um, and the circles, of course, are earthquakes that we uh, identified during my um, survey. Now, um, you might ask, how come we didn't find uh, the uh, October 20th, uh, 2011 earthquake? How come there's no earthquakes where the Roman numeral 6 is? Um, and it turns out that the Earthcope uh, portable array, the U.S. array stations, moved eastward just one week before the uh, 4.8, 2011 earthquake happened. And this is actually demonstrates that there are two famous principles in seismology. The first principle is that if you want to cause earthquakes in an area, you put in a seismic network. And the reason is because if you put in a seismic network, you can locate events that might have magnitudes of one and a half or two and a half that nobody knew about before. So in some sense, when you start finding earthquakes, people will think you caused them. The second fundamental principle of seismic networks is that if you want to cause a big earthquake, is you remove the array because there are so many situations when people remove the stations and then the big earthquake occurs. And that was certainly true here. That is, the big earthquake occurred a week after the stations moved eastward. But back to this map, what we're seeing here is that in the area where the uh, 2011 earthquake was most intense, there aren't any injection wells. And even the events we did locate to the north there, there don't, there's no injection wells near them. Um, on the other hand, the right-hand map, they're the same uh, earthquakes, but instead of injection wells, these are producing gas wells. What we notice in the highest intensity area from the October 2011 earthquake is a field called the Fashing Gas Field. Um, and uh, the earthquake was most intense right in the middle of the Fashing Gas Field. Um, and there's quite a bit of evidence historically that the 2011 earthquake and previous earthquakes in this area are uh, caused by extraction rather than injection. For example, here's a map of the um, uh, uh, production in the area of the highest intensity of the 2011 earthquake. The vertical accent is the uh, volume produced in barrels per month. The green is oil produced. The blue is water produced. The red is water reinjected, And the black is net, that is oil plus water minus injected water. And what you see is that uh, there were no earthquakes in this area until 1973, just after the injected, I'm sorry, the net produced volume of fluids increased. There was another earthquake in 1983, just after a sudden increase in the production of uh, uh, fluids. There was an earthquake in 1993 that was not apparently related to uh, extraction. But then the 2011 earthquake in the upper right hand corner with a magnitude of about uh, 4.8, it occurred just after the extracted fluids in this area uh, had passed the highest level they had been at in the last 10 years. So these data suggest that uh, extraction is responsible for the earthquakes in the Eagleford, at least in this area. So to summarize the situation in the Eagleford, um, there were oil and gas fields developed in the 1950s. There were no earthquakes reported until the 70s. Nearly all the subsequent quakes that have been analyzed in detail are within or at the boundary of producing oil and gas fields, and several occur after increases of extraction of oil and water. Previously published studies conclude that the events from 1974 to 1993 are probably caused by the extraction of fluids, oil and water production. Um, the 2011 magnitude 4.8 earthquake is in or near the fashing gas fields, and it's more than 15 kilometers from the nearest injection well, so it's hard to attribute it to injection. A reasonable conclusion, Occam's razor, is that the 2000 earthquake is not caused by injection, but by extraction, as suggested for previous seismicity. Okay, um, I now want to go to where the green circle is, uh, south of the Panhandle, near a town called Snyder, and discuss earthquakes there. Um, in Snyder, uh, in West Texas, south of the Panhandle, um, there was a magnitude 4.6 earthquake in 1978. And uh, years ago, 
uh, Scott Davis and Wayne Pennington published a paper where they uh, investigated this event. And um, in the lower panel of the graph on the left, um, we're plotting the amount of water injected on the vertical axis versus year. And as you can see, the field, uh, the Cogdale field, which uh, uh, where the earthquake occurred, um, opened around 1950. And for several years, they simply extracted fluids. And then starting around 1955, they started a massive water flooding project. And the maps on the right are a uh, map of the Cogdale field, which is about 20 kilometers from north to south. The circles are wells in the Cogdale field. The black circles are wells where they were injecting water. And they inject around the exterior of the field and uh, drive water and oil to the center to increase production. And between 1955 and the 70s, there was this water flooding going on in the uh, Cogdale field. In the early 1970s, people began to feel earthquakes. That's the right-hand uh, axis of the, map, of the graph at lower uh, left. And the uh, bars are the number of earthquakes that were uh, uh, noticed, were recorded. And then in 1978, the magnitude 4.6 happened. Um, earthquakes continued until 1982, which is just about when the uh, water flooding operation uh, uh, ramped down in the Cogdale field. So early activity in the Snyder field is related to injection with water flooding. Now, recently, a uh, uh, visiting scientist, Wiegan and myself, thought we would take another look at earthquakes in near Snyder and in the Cogdale field. Um, the map on the left, the uh, rectangle up in Texas, shows the area of the map. Um, it's a uh, six-county area. The uh, triangles are uh, earthscope seismic stations, and the red circles are earthquakes that had been reported by the USGS and the Array Network facility um, near the Cogdale field. The map on the right is a blow-up, and what we see is the Cogdale field is the field where the earthquakes are. Um, so there was 20 years between 1982 and 2006 with no earthquakes in the Cogdale field. And then in 2006 and subsequently, uh, earthquakes began again. And we, uh, since the uh, Earth Scope US Array stations were there from 2010 and 2011, we thought we would look at these earthquakes and try to investigate the cause. Now, we presume that the cause would probably be uh, injection again. However, when we look at injection data in the Cogdale field, there is no major uh, uh, injection going on in the Cogdale field between 1990 and the present. However, beginning in 2001, uh, they started injecting CO2 in the Cogdale field to increase uh, production. And in fact, this ramped up to fairly high values in 2004. This is a graph where on the uh, vertical axis is the amount of gas being injected into the Cogdale field. Horizontal axis is time. Uh, green is the produced gas in the field, and uh, red is the injected gas. And what we can see is that in 2000, by 2004, injection rates were pretty high in Cogdale. Earthquakes started again in 2006, and uh, including uh, the ones that we studied in 2010 and 2011. And there was a magnitude 4.3 in uh, September of 2011. So concerning the Snyder and Cogdale uh, earthquakes, um, water flooding probably triggered the earthquakes from 1977 to 1982, including the magnitude 4.6 in 1978. Gas injection probably triggered the earthquakes after 2006, including the 4.3 in 2011. And if this is correct, this is the only instance we know of where CO2 injection has probably caused an earthquake with a magnitude greater than 3. Um, this has potential implications for carbon sequestration as a strategy to manage climate change, uh, where people are talking about injecting huge volumes of CO2 into the Earth so that it doesn't go into the atmosphere. Uh, prior to the Cogdale uh, events that we studied, there hadn't been any events reported with magnitudes higher than, say, one or so in CO2 injection environments. So uh, here we have at least one event where uh, apparently uh, CO2 injection has um, possibly caused larger earthquakes. However, this doesn't answer all the questions. If we look at the map on the right again, 
we were studying earthquakes in the Cogdale field, uh, which again is where the red circles are, the circles, the earthquakes that we studied. There is a field to the north called the Salt Creek field, and a field to the south called the Kelly Snyder field. And uh, the question is, why are there earthquakes in the Cogdale field and not in, salt, in the Salt Creek field or the Kelly Snyder fields? The Salt Creek and Kelly Snyder fields have nearly identical histories in terms of production and injection of water and injection of gas. So why do you get earthquakes related to the injection of gas and water in one field and not in the others? Okay, um, the next earthquakes I want to talk to you about are near Alice in South Texas where the green circle is here. Um, this is a map of South Texas. The, uh, the rectangle in the Texas shows where we are. Um, Alice is a town uh, west of Corpus Christi, about 60 miles. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, circles show the uh, area where the earth earthquakes in 1997 and 2010, each which had magnitudes of about 3.9, were felt. The highest intensities were uh, intensity 5 or 6. And these were felt right at the edge of the gray area, which is the Stratton field. The gray areas on this slide are oil and gas fields. Um, now, um, on this map, we have the triangles, our earthscope stations that were operating uh, in 2010. And you can see that there were earthscapes, the state earthscope uh, US array stations all the way around the Alice area. When the 1997 earthquake occurred, these stations weren't in place, and the nearest station was in Hockley, Texas. If you look on the Texas uh, uh, icon there, Hockley is a station up the coast from Alice, about 300 kilometers. Um, and there were uh, a number of questions about the 1997 quake, uh, which were hard to explain without the Earthscope stations. For example, um, I'm a seismologist, so I'm going to show you at least one seismogram. When the 1997 quake occurred, one puzzling thing was that the quake didn't have nice P waves and S waves that were sharp and impulsive. It's very hard to locate. And so even at the closest station, you really didn't see much in the way of uh, good body waves. And then the largest phase for this occurred eight full minutes after the uh, earthquake occurred. Um, and uh, this and many other puzzling features about the Alice earthquakes were explained when we had the Earthscope U.S. array stations in place. Um, it turns out that the U.S. array stations allowed us to show that the Alice uh, quakes were very shallow with focal depths of about uh, one and a half kilometers. Um, and this huge phase that's traveling at less than a kilometer per second is some love wave that's trapped in very low velocity sediments along the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, now, were the Alice earthquakes uh, induced or triggered, or were they natural? Um, this is a graph of oil and gas production. The uh, white circles are the production of oil, and the black circles are production of gas from the 1950s onward. And we can see that both the uh, heyday of the Stratton field for oil and gas was before 1980, and the field production has been declining since then. Uh, and had, was, uh, the production was definitely less in 1997 and 2010 when the first Alice earthquakes occurred. However, um, I think uh, there is fairly convincing evidence that the Alice quakes probably were related to production in the field. Um, first of all, the shallow focal depth is unusual, and it's at about the depth of production from the Stratton field. Uh, and the amount of uh, oil and gas produced in the Stratton field is considerable, uh, and the fields occurred, uh, the quakes occurred right on the edge of the Stratton field. So there's a the, uh, the case is not overwhelming, but it's fairly strong that the Alice quakes were probably induced or triggered by a, uh, production in the Stratton field. Okay, the last um, earthquake I want to talk to is in East Texas. It was a magnitude 4.8 uh, that occurred on the 17th of May in 2012 near a town called Timpson. Um, here we have a map. The uh, mapped area is uh, shown in the, uh, from, you can see the rectangle on the Texas map where this uh, map is. The gray areas here are oil and gas fields. Um, the uh, ellipses are the felt area for the May 
17, 2012 magnitude 4.8 earthquake. The highest intensities in this earthquake were intensity 7. There were areas where the uh, brick veneer was uh, blown off of houses and uh, fireplaces inside houses were destroyed. Um, the uh, 2012 earthquake was not near an oil or gas field. Um, and the previous earthquakes were nearly unknown in the area. Um, the largest, uh, well, the only nearby earthquake was this gray circle uh, in ni labeled 1981 to the uh, east of the uh, uh, high intensity area. It was a magnitude three. Um, and so the question is, what is uh, what's causing these uh, the earthquake and the subsequent earthquakes near Timson? Um, this is a map. Uh, that's quite blown up. You notice the scale at the bottom of the map at four kilometers. And on this map, the uh, white triangles are stations that were operated by uh, Wesley Brown at Stephen F. Austin uh, University in Nacogdoches and also by the U.S. Geological Survey colleagues of mine. Um, stations or uh, temporary stations were um, installed in this area. The circles are earthquakes that were located. The green and red earthquakes are locations after these stations were in place. The red circles are the best located events because all the stations were in place. Um, and the red line is a mapped fault that goes right through this area. Um, and the ellipse in the center is the area of highest shaking, the intensity uh, 7. And what this shows that from our analysis of the data collected in these stations is that um, the aftershocks are occurring along a linear feature uh, the depth of the aftershocks uh, was about 1.7 to 4.5 kilometers. And these yellow squares labeled W are injection wells. Uh, and within three kilometers of the earthquakes, there are two injection wells that have been injecting at 1.8 kilometers depth since late 2006 and early 2007. So the earthquakes occur along a mapped fault. Uh, they occur at or below the depth of injection and they're within a couple kilometers of two relatively high volume injection wells. Um, this is a uh, shows the injection history at the two highest volume wells. Um, the uh, bar on the uh, left shows the 100,000 barrels of water per month and you can see at the north well injection started early in 2007 and stayed at about 100,000 barrels a month. At the south well, injection started late in 2006 and actually we had uh, uh, rates between two and 300,000 barrels of water per month. The uh, circles are uh, pressures uh, at these wells. And you note, for example, at the south well that the pressure stays pretty much constant over this time, but the volume injected uh, stays steady or de decreases. The circles at the bottom are when earthquakes occurred. We went to a seismic station in Nacogdoches and looked for other earthquakes that might have occurred before 2012. The first one we found was in 2008. There were earthquakes in 2010 and 2011. And then earthquakes started uh, more seriously in 2012, including the magnitude 4.8 that got our attention. So features of the Timson earthquakes. Um, these earthquakes began more than a year after injection commenced. Uh, the injection wells nearby were relatively high volume, greater than 100,000 barrels of water per month. Um, earthquakes occurred within two to three kilometers of these wells. The earthquakes occurred along a mapped fault, um, and the earthquake depths were at or below the depth of injection. So um, all five of these areas we've looked at, we have earthquakes that appear like they probably or might be related to human activity. Um, I have a disclaimer. I have to say that with induced earthquakes, 100% proof is never possible. Um, I think of the situation of uh, lung cancer. Um, when my mother died, she had cancer in her lungs and she never smoked. Um, other people we know smoke all their lives and don't get lung cancer. And so it's very hard to prove for an individual whether lung uh, smoking caused lung cancer. Cancer. We can do statistics and we can find out how many people uh, smoking caused cancer, but we don't know which ones. And the same thing is true with earthquakes uh, uh, related to injection or uh, extraction. Um, we can do statistics and show certainly that some of these earthquakes had to be caused by 
uh, fluid injection or extraction, but it's always possible that uh, uh, for an individual event that it was just going to happen anyway. However, um, what I've shown you is a tale of five cities and really seven different results. Um, injection probably triggered the earthquakes in the Barnett area, especially near Dallas-Fort Worth. Injection probably triggered the Timson earthquake in East Texas. Extraction is probably responsible for the largest Eagleford area earthquakes, although I didn't talk about them today. There are a few small Eagleford area quakes that probably are related to injection. Um, extraction probably triggered the earthquakes near Alice, although um, fields like the Stratton field, which have been active since the 1930s, uh, if it was a person, if the Stratton field was a person, you would say this person had been around the block because they have been extracting gas, they've been extracting oil, they've been injecting, they've been uh, re-drilling. And so uh, extraction probably triggered the quakes, but there's been a lot of other activities going on there that might also be related. And finally, um, water flooding probably triggered the earthquakes in near Snyder, Texas, in the Cogdale field prior to 1982, but the injection of carbon dioxide probably triggered the recent Snyder, Texas quakes. So the bottom line is that life isn't simple. There isn't any particular one situation where we're causing these earthquakes. There's a variety where it appears that humans might be causing earthquake. And finally, <coughs> I haven't found any silver bullet. That is, I can't propose any simple guideline that would ensure that we don't trigger earthquakes. And I guess this is, was a disappointment for me at first, but at first, but in fact, it's uh, probably not a surprise. Um, if you consider the vast differences in geology that we're uh, talking about in the Barnett, in the Eagleford, and then uh, in the Cogdale fields, um, it would be really surprising where the geology was so different that the same physics would be uh, uh, working such that the same injection uh, or extraction environments would cause earthquakes. Um, as if you believe that uh, physics is related to geology, um, it's not a surprise that we don't have one silver bullet to explain uh, wh when you get uh, induced or triggered earthquakes. Um, now I might say that for statistical purposes, it's often easy to establish that a quake is near injection wells or petroleum fields, but it's nearly impossible to reach consensus about the probability is induced. Um, I consider the earthquakes in near Dallas-Fort Worth as one of the strongest cases of uh, earthquakes that are probably caused by injection, but some uh, quite uh, credible seismologists have uh, published papers saying that they don't think they're induced. And so, uh, uh, and from a industry management or if you're a government policymaker, in a way it doesn't matter because you're likely to be under pressure to respond whether they're induced or not and you may have to respond well before the seismology community reaches a consensus about whether they're induced. So for example on the map we have uh, the uh, green earthquakes are almost certainly natural because there's no oil or gas fields or injection wells nearby but all the uh, red earthquakes are occurred near active oil and gas fields or near injection wells. Um, now so if I'm doing statistics, I don't like to do statistics on induced or not induced, so I like to do st st statistics on earthquakes that are near oil or gas fields or near active injection wells. And the trouble is that's too much of a mouthful, so I've, I've tried to think of quicker ways to say rather than saying we want to look at earthquakes near oil and gas uh, active fields or injection wells, I thought of quiche, quakes in close with human enterprise, quiche quakes. And so far, I'm the only person who has uh, proposed this, and none of my colleagues have suggested that this is a good idea. But I do think counting quakes that are close to human activity is uh, more robust um, than trying to establish once and for all whether they are induced or not. No. What should society do about unconventional gas? I read in the paper all kinds of people who say, you know, fracking is bad and we should stop and so on. Um, well, I must say that developing these unconventional gas areas like the Eagleford and the uh, Barnett and the Bakken and the Marcellus is favorable for a huge variety of people. Um, that is, suppose you're somebody who feels that we should have less reliance on foreign energy sources. 
suppose you're worried that uh, fighting over oil in the Middle East might lead to the Third World War. Clearly, developing uh, uh, domestic gas is, a, is something you would support. Suppose you're somebody who doesn't like coal and nuclear power for energy. Coal is, you know, uh, probably responsible for a lot of global warming. warming. And so you'd say, well, suppose you want an alternative, much cleaner form of uh, energy. Uh, if you're that kind of person, you'd be in favor of developing uh, unconventional gas. Suppose you're a, uh, a really green and you think that we should have renewable energy. Uh, you want everything to be wind and solar. However, um, you have discovered that if you turn off your air conditioner, your spouse and your children will leave you. So you want a clean source of energy during this development period. You probably think that uh, developing uh, gas, unconventional gas, is a good thing. And finally, suppose you're somebody who owns or produces gas. Uh, it's a good thing. Now, the, the, uh, the cadre of people we have on the left here is a huge uh, political block. We have the hawks who are worried about uh, war in the Middle East. We have people worried about global warming. We have the, uh, the hippies who want everything to be wind and solar. And we have business that produces gas. So uh, a broad variety of us are in favor of producing this. However, um, is this safe? Um, is this something that, uh, what, what do we need to worry about when we're doing this? Now, as concern as, uh, with respect to this development and earthquakes, I want to emphasize that fracking isn't the problem. That is, fracking, I'm unaware of, have caused any earthquakes with magnitude larger than 3.8 or so. And the situations where the hydrofracking itself has caused earthquakes are so rare that it's not really a concern. Second of all, there are tens of thousands of disposal wells, and most of these uh, cause no quakes that disturb anyone. Um, someone like me, a seismologist, I never hear about a disposal well unless there's an earthquake near it. And so I'm likely to make statements like, oh yeah, disposal wells cause earthquakes. However, my friends in the oil patch would say, you know, we've been injecting in tens of thousands of wells since the 1930s, and uh, they don't seem to bother anybody. If they did, Texas would be famous for having, for just rocking with earthquakes because we've been doing this on a broad scale in Texas. Texas is not famous for earthquakes as my uh, initial cartoon uh, underlines. So uh, this is not hugely dangerous. Now, a couple years ago when I would talk about this, I would say that injection earth triggered earthquakes are small. Um, recently, there's been some quakes uh, so that one has begun to question this. The magnitude 4.8 near Timpson, which may be injection triggered, is not small. Uh, there was a 5.6 in Arkansas last year, and uh, it, the uh, seismology community hasn't completely reached consensus as to whether it's related to uh, human activity or whether it's natural. But clearly, a uh, 4.8 or a 5.6 in an urban area like Dallas is not something uh, you want to have. So uh, uh, this is, uh, I'd have to say that where we are with the research is it's proceeding, but that injection triggered earthquakes are poorly understood. Um, and so it shouldn't surprise you, since I'm a, uh, earth, uh, a research scientist, that my advice is that we need more research. Uh, the situation isn't simple, and we need more research on this. Um, now, I want to close just to remind you that not all earthquakes in Texas aren't uh, caused by humans or possibly caused by humans. It isn't all quiche. Um, this is a map of West Texas, or West Texas, and the green circles are earthquakes that couldn't be caused by humans because there's nothing going on that could cause them. The two biggest earthquakes in Texas history are the Valentine earthquake of 1931 and the Alpine earthquake of 1995. Both had magnitudes of about six. Um, the Valentine earthquake uh, in 1931, it was called the Valentine earthquake because it occurred in the month of, it was called the Valentine earthquake because it occurred in the month of August near Valentine, Texas, the town, Valentine. The Alpine earthquake was called the Alpine earthquake because it occurred near the town of Alpine. Um, now, after the Alpine earthquake, about magnitude 6, um, a uh, Texas winery came out with a special vintage, uh, and the St. Genevieve uh, winery changed their label for this. They have Their label has a uh, mesa in a uh, field, and for this special vintage, they had a fault that was fracturing the mesa in the field. They called this special vintage earthquake red, um, when this came out after the 1995 quake, I bought a couple um, cases of it. 
um, and I would serve it whenever seismologists came to town. And it was truly a wonderful wine. All the seismologists loved it, and you, you knew it was wonderful because it cost about four dollars and thirty cents a bottle. But was the 1995 earthquake caused by humans? No, humans weren't doing any things that would do that. But did that 1995 earthquake induce winery activity? Yes, it did. Um, now, um, almost all the research that I've talked about today has been published. And so this, on uh, this slide is a bibliography of the recent work that we've published in the last couple years. Um, and uh, if you're really interested in the Texas earthquakes, about 10 years ago, Scott Davis and I published a book on Texas earthquakes. Um, and with that, I will answer questions. Great. Thanks very much, Cliff. That was a very lively talk. Uh, lots of interesting information in Texas. So uh, there are a bunch of questions that have been submitted. So I'm going to start going through those. Uh, the first one I can probably field. It was a question by Barat Baum asking uh, a little bit more information about the U.S. array stations. Uh, so I'll just I'll go ahead and field that one. Uh, the U.S. array stations, the, the ones that Cliff was presenting, were transportable array sites. The transportable array is a program that uh, is enabled by the EarthScope project from the National Science Foundation. It started on the West Coast in 2004, uh, and it is a footprint of about 400, and 400 to 450 uh, broadband seismometers that are migrating across the continent from west to east on a 70-kilometer spaced grid. So at any given spot, those are in the ground for about two years recording broadband seismic data, uh, and they just finished moving, and they are now parked on the East Coast uh, temporarily, and then in a couple of years, they're going to start going to Alaska. So, uh, Barat, your question also asked if they provide or serve any other functions. Most of them have, in fact, all of them now have uh, high resolution atmospheric pressure and infrasound sensors on them. So, they're a atmospheric array as well as a seismic array now. So, anyway, I just wanted to field that one real quick. Uh, so, Andy, could I add one thing? Sure. Uh, it turns out the data from all these stations is publicly available at the IRIS website. So in principle, you or your junior high school student could acquire these data. And I must say the website is not designed for your junior high school student, but it's public data. Um, you don't have to pay a cent to get it. You can just go online and anybody can have it. So it's not some secret or some expensive thing. Very good point, Cliff. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for adding that in. Um, so uh, first question is from Tom Brochure, and Tom is asking, why do earthquakes in the Barnett Shale cluster near the northeastern corner of the geographic limits of the shale? Um, well, Tom, that is an excellent question. Um, you know, the question is, why come we don't, whereas we know they're not in the south because there's no uh, injection wells in the south, but there's certainly injection wells in the west part of the shale. And all I can tell you is that we have a, a project going now that's on, funded by the Department of Energy, the RIPSI program, where I'm collaborating with geologists at the uh, uh, Texas Bureau of Economic Geology. And we're looking more carefully at um, what, uh, you know, what are the environments where these earthquakes are occurring and where the injection is occurring in different parts of the shale to see if there's a geological clue. Now, I'm an earthquake seismologist. But I bet you the answer is not in the earthquakes. I'll bet it's in the geology. OK, uh, another question from Barat. He is asking, have you come across any resistance from the oil and gas industry related to your investigation slash study of earthquakes related to these deep injection wells? Um, not anything uh, that I would call resistance. Uh, I must say I've given some public talks where uh, sort of old uh, old oil people sort of say, you need to be quiet because you're going to cost a lot of people money. But certainly, I've never had any resistance from uh, companies. In fact, the companies have been good about sharing information with me. They have been, I've never yet had uh, been able to collaborate with a company on a, a real project. Several of the companies have invited me to speak uh, about the, the stuff I'm talking about today. So I, I would say they have not been willing to collaborate in uh, any depth, but they certainly haven't uh, done anything to discourage me. 
All right. Uh, next question is from Sid Halser, and Sid is curious: Is it important to know depth of injection when assessing the relationship to earthquakes? Well, certainly, um, if you do an empirical study of earthquakes that appear to be caused by injection wells, almost all the earthquakes are either at the depth of injection or deeper. Um, and so, if you can get uh, good depths for the earthquakes, and if you have information about injection, it's certainly interesting to uh, see if that holds up. All right, uh, another question from Barat. Uh, is it possible that extraction can cause large voids or a vacuum effect that causes movement and shifts of strata and layers related to the earthquakes? Um, I'm not an expert on that, however, I'd be surprised if there were actual voids that were large, but there's no question that when you remove material from underground, uh, that it changes the uh, stresses in the overburden. Um, some areas where people have uh, been extracting water or oil, um, if you do uh, geodesy, you'll find that they're sinking. Um, in fact, this is uh, known in, there's areas in Texas near the coast, near, there's a town south of Houston called Pasadena. It used to get drinking water um, from uh, water wells, but the Pasadena is just about three feet above sea level, and they noticed that the town was sinking into the sea. So the phenomenon of removing fluids and uh, things adjust uh, is not a new one. It's not just related to uh, earthquakes and oil, but it certainly does happen. Okay. Um, r related to uh, one of Barat's earlier questions, uh, Deborah Weiser is asking, what physical mechanism do you propose for the Eagle Ford earthquakes related to extraction? And she, theor she sort of parenthesizes such as compaction or subsidence. Um, there's been some uh, papers written on that, but I I'd have to say that the uh, uh, models for causing earthquakes by extraction aren't as uh, clear as the ones as earthquakes caused by injection. But yes, the, uh, the general sorts of models that people propose is that if you remove enough volume of material, that can change stresses either in the overburden or in adjacent areas, um, and, or, or fluids can move around so that the pressures on uh, faults can change. Um, so whereas the, uh, for injection, the air hockey model I think is simple. Uh, to anybody who's ever played air hockey, the uh, models for uh, in uh, extraction-induced earthquakes are more complicated and have to do, uh, subsidence would be the clearest uh, uh, simple-minded simple, simple thing you could say, but that's a little bit too simple-minded. Another question from Deborah is asking, have you examined stress maps to see if one field is more likely to trigger a quake than another? Any more thoughts on why one field triggers, any more thoughts on that sort of dependency? Um, well, I haven't I'm unaware of detailed stress maps in Texas. Um, the uh, Zobax has published uh, stress maps on uh, broad regional scales, and the earthquakes in uh, the Barnett Shale and the uh, Snyder area and in the Eagleford area, the uh, sense of the mechanisms of these earthquakes is consistent with the regional stresses that the Zobax suggest ought to be in this area. Um, I suspect that the uh, difference between the areas is not so much the uh, regional stress. I suspect it more has to do with the, the geology. That is, certainly the Barnett Shale overlying the Eagleford is a very different geological situation than, I'm sorry, the Barnett Shale overlying the Ellenberger is a very different geological situation than in the Eagleford, um, where you have fault uh, bounded fields. I mean, the, there are faults, old faults that are trapping the oil. And that's a very different situation than in Snyder, where you have this huge uh, old reef complex. So I just think the real differences that explain the differences will probably be found to be geological. All right, uh, next question is from Bill Leith. And Bill asks, uh, considering the larger induced earthquakes, it seems possible that they have only occurred in crystalline basement, uh, e.g. Arkansas, Ohio, Oklahoma, Trinidad and Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Is it possible that the variation you're seeing in Texas reflects variability in access of injected fluids to the basement rock? Well, it's possible. Um, uh, I'm getting some uh, 
questions from highly knowledgeable people, so I could turn around and ask Bill if he thinks so. Um, uh, I would say it's possible. I think the problem we have in Texas is of the earthquakes I've talked about, only in uh, three situations do we really know the depth of the earthquakes. In Alice, in Timpson, uh, uh, we know that, and in Dallas Fort Worth, we know the depths of the earthquakes pretty well. But most areas, the 70 kilometer station of the uh, 70 kilometer station spacing, spacing of U.S. array isn't sufficient to get very good depths. So uh, it's hard to generalize too much with only three uh, examples of what the depths of the earthquakes are. I think that partially answers uh, another couple questions that uh, one from uh, Kyle Basler Reader and one from Paul Vincent who are asking basically, do you have depth statistics on natural versus uh, close to induced earthquakes? Uh, and can you comment on, on those? Um, I would just say one of the, there's one of the secrets of seismology that all seismologists know is that you can get much more accurate locations of the map position of an earthquake than the depth. Um, in order to get good depths, you either have to have relatively large earthquakes where you can model the waves relatively accurately because you ha have good information about crustal structure, or you have to have situations like we did in East Texas um, where you have a, a, a very close by network of stations that you can get location. So most earthquakes in the whole United States, we really don't know what depth they're at. All right. Um... Next question is from Emily Brodsky, and Emily is asking, what are your views on the issues involved in fracking the Monterey Shale in close vicinity to the San Andreas Fault? Do you think that the apparent maximum to induced earthquake sizes is a physical limitation or due to the availability of large faults? Well, that's an uh, important question. Um, I, I'm not hugely familiar with uh, the California situation. I must say, I think in the uh, uh, dialogue that goes on about policy making, that is what kind of regulation or policy should there be about uh, disposal and so on, I think it's hugely important to consider the amount of development in population. That is, in Texas, areas like Dallas-Fort Worth, the, uh, if there had been a, a 4.8 or a 5.8 earthquake in Dallas-Fort Worth, it could be uh, Oh, tens or hundreds of million dollars of damage. Um, on the other hand, there's areas in Texas, in West Texas, where you can have a magnitude six earthquake and it doesn't bother anybody. That is, I've often said in West Texas, you know, if it's not oil or football, who cares? Um, so I think one thing that hasn't happened in the discussion about regulation is uh, sort of what is the degree of development and population in an area. Because um, when I've been studying the Bakken recently, when I started looking at seismic events, there were all these uh, huge seismic events that were going off every week, every during the day. And when I located them, it turns out they are uh, chemical explosions in northeastern Wyoming. Uh, the nation's largest open pit coal mines are there, and they have uh, explosions, chemical explosions that have magnitudes as large as magnitude four. And uh, they don't seem to bother anybody. Magnitude four earthquakes and explosions in uh, northeastern Wyoming. If you look on the uh, Google map to see what's up there, you can see why there's not much up there. So I think we need to be a lot more sensitive who's living there and what uh, structures are there. And, uh, uh, so sidestep the question because uh, California clearly has large earthquakes and it's not clear to me how to deal with that. All right, next question from Yevor Kamer, uh, would you expect to see different statistical properties such as different frequency magnitude distributions, inter-event timing, or fractal dimensions in triggered versus non-triggered earthquakes? Um, all I can say is that in, uh, for a few of the examples, we've looked at the uh, what's called the B value. Basically, this is the, uh, a statistic that measures the proportion of large and small earthquakes in an area, and uh, the the uh, the B values or fractal dimensions of the earthquakes in Dallas Fort Worth and uh, other areas I've looked at aren't that different from natural earthquakes. Um, so um, the uh, there's been suggestions that people should look for that, but I haven't found that is a good diagnostic in Texas 
to decide whether earthquakes are uh, human caused or natural. All right. Uh, next question is from uh, Dean Childs at the Pascal Instrument Center. And Dean is curious, what is the difference in injection process between injection of waste material and injection fracking? Is it just a volumetric thing? Well, there's uh, a couple of things to note. Um, first of all, when you're doing a frack job, a frack job typically lasts only a few hours or at most a few days. Um, second of all, you are injecting at high pressures uh, pressure is high enough to actually fracture the rock. Um, these injection wells, uh, they don't want to fracture the rock, um, so typically they'll inject at lower pressures, lower than the uh, fracture strength of a rock, and they uh, want to inject large volumes, and so they'll be injecting every day for months or years. So, uh, and then finally, you're injecting into different uh, environments. The reason you're fracking is because things don't flow. If the uh, strata was something where fluids flowed easily, you wouldn't have to frack it. Um, whereas uh, when you're injecting, you want to find a strata where uh, fluids flow easily away without having uh, enormous pressures. All right. Um, another question is from Ramesh Singh. And Ramesh is asking, what is your opinion of the Virginia earthquake of August 2011? Is it related to water injection? Um, is, uh, I, I'm presuming the Virginia earthquake is the uh, magnitude five something that uh, shook Washington D.C. That um, is correct. My understanding, my understanding is that that earthquake occurred in an area that was there were no injection wells very close uh, nearby. Um, that is that earthquake. Uh, the, the seismology community, I believe, considers that earthquake is almost certainly a natural earthquake. Now, in elsewhere in Virginia, in West Virginia. Tiny earthquakes have occurred near injection wells, uh, but that particular earthquake, the one that got all the attention, I believe is considered to be natural.